Welcome to the Neural Implant Podcast, where we talk with the people behind the current events and breakthroughs in brain implants in an understandable way, helping bring together various fields involved in neuroprosthetics. Here is your host, Ladin Yurichek. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Neural Implant Podcast. Today's guest is Dr. John Seymour, and he's associate professor at UT Health in neurosurgery, and he's working a lot on brain-computer interfaces, especially as they are related to fabrication and novel substrate materials, and then speech-related deficits, epilepsy, lots of different things. Dr. Seymour, do you want to introduce yourself better than I just did? Oh, that was great. Yeah, let me mention like one unique thing about my lab is it lives both at UT Health and Rice University. And I'm physically we're at Rice. My primary appointment is at UT Health Neurosurgery. And obviously I'm not a neurosurgeon, but an engineer working there. And both institutions are really outstanding and very supportive of developing neurotechnology. And maybe five years ago, they, they, were, they were not on anyone's radar as like a neurotech center, but I think their investments in neurotech infrastructure and faculty have really changed that. And I think the name recognition of Rice is what's there. And at UT Health, maybe it's not so obvious, but I was surprised to learn and coming to UT Health that our neuro, neurosurgery department is ranked 14th in the country and for NIH funding. So that was exciting. They have a strong track record of translation. And regarding Rice, you've probably heard around three years ago, they started the Neural Engineering Initiative. And that's been a like, phenomenal launch pad for many new labs and uh, their capabilities. So really good resources for microfabrication in particular. Anyways, I'm really fortunate to be at both these institutions and talk about my labs take on neural implants. So we, just a high level summary, like we've gone all in on depth arrays. And I think the future of manufacturing will be additive approaches for customized depth arrays. And I think computational modeling will be a really critical uh, piece of all this that ties it all together. Uh, so that's where the lab's focused right now. Yeah, that's pretty exciting. Geographically, how close are Rice and U UT Health? Yeah, great question. So it's like from well, one uh, institute to the other, at least the buildings that I work in, it's an eight minute walk. And there's one main road between them. So it depends on the timing of the lights, but it's really close. So Texas Medical Center, which you've probably heard is the world's largest medical center in the world. And it's a group of many institutions. And we're just fortunate that both UT Health and Rice are across the street from each other. Okay. Yeah, that does sound that does sound really nice. The best of both worlds, and you're able to utilize the experience of both of them. So you were saying, okay, let's go, let's go right into this. You were saying the future of neural implants is additive depth electrodes. What does that mean? And why do you think that? I would say uh, I think that manufacturing is less interesting than depth arrays. So if it's okay with you, let's talk about why make depth arrays. And then I think how you make them is secondary, but it's a really hard problem. But if it's okay, I'll, let's talk about why would you make a depth array? So I'd say my mission in coming to the neurosurgery department was really to make next generation depth arrays. And let me define what I mean by a depth array, just in case there's somebody out there who just they're not familiar with, maybe they're familiar with iMac, NeuroPixel probes and Michigan arrays, things like that. So a depth array is generally, it's a silicone or polyurethane, relatively flexible cylinder. And like a very similar to a DBS, a DBS is a form of depth array. And in epilepsy, the stereotactic electroencephalogram is now the sort of go-to tool for diagnosis. And it used to be ECOG was really the critical approach. And there was a kind of a loose argument that was less invasive. Uh, and so this SEG has displaced the ECOG almost completely in epilepsy centers around the world. And it turns out that is a minimally invasive way. 
And it, it, like I said, it's not completely intuitive why that's true. So let me walk through some of the reasons this has become a very safe and effective diagnostic tool. And I would say that the first thing, the SEG is about 0.8 millimeters, so much bigger than the kind of tools that I used to make or that probably you're making now in the lab. And it's a little bit smaller than DBS, but you might imagine it, it's, it's going to displace tissue and it, you have to avoid blood vessels. So one major breakthrough in the use of these depth arrays is just structural MRI, and now it's ubiquitous. And so you know where all the major blood vessels are. And so now you can use this depth array in, in combination with structural MRI, preoperative planning, and assistive robots. And you can hit any target with great precision. And for the neurosurgeons, this is just another day in the office. They're very good at hitting any target within a millimeter at any depth. And they might put in 10, 15 of these in an epilepsy patient. And the richness, the richness of the data is much better than EEG or even ECOG because it's so much closer to the potential seizure sites. So for those reasons, it's been effective. I think what surprised me is how safe they are in terms of reducing hemorrhaging and infection. So that's been a really big change. And so the neurosurgery department, they wanted next generation depth arrays. And so the question, I, or I think the solution that most people, particularly in our space, they immediately go to is, yeah, let's just manufacture it with more sophisticated technologies. Let's add a lot of electrodes to this structure and use that to get more information. You could use it for PCI, et cetera, et cetera. I don't think that is going to win a lot of grants. It's true to a degree, but to me, the critical question that's in neuroscience is not how you manufacture these to make more and more electrodes. It's what is the optimal design if you're going to implant through a small twist drill hole, as they call it. And if I didn't mention it, it's very important enough. These are 2.4 millimeter openings in the skull. So it's the minimal size of the hole in the skull and the size of the damage to the dura that we think greatly reduces the infection. Even this is significantly smaller than even a DBS burr hole. So all those things play into it. And so forgive me for jumping around on this. So I would say that the evidence suggests that we need to assign a cost function to just doing the surgery itself, right? The, whether it's DBS or ECOG, there is something really important about the surgery. The Time it takes to implant the technology turns out to be really important. And I'll come back to my last point, but the time to implant an SEG is averaging six minutes, which is like way faster than most labs can implant anything into a rat. And the reason they can do that was again, that it's the, it's the surgical assistance, it's the structural MRI. And so they, again, they can hit these deep targets. And back to my previous point, if we want to maximize information capacity and we're constrained by these really small but safe and effective openings in the skull, how do we do that? So another way to state that question, I think that's the broad question. How do you maximize information capacity? The way you probably heard it framed is what is better, local field potentials or single units? Right, that's an age old debate that we continue to have. And I think there is an answer out there. I certainly don't have it. If you ask people in the field and we're just crowdsourcing this question, the answer is single units, right? We were taught single units are the most effective information channels in part because they're really, they're really beautiful waveforms that are repeatable every time a cell fires. And that makes it relatively easy to do source separation between one neuron and another. So you have this great information, this set of information channels in your system. And because the waveforms are so repeatable, we can do really nice SNR on, on that data as it comes in. And then you compare that to the local field potential. And that's when you know, oh, wow, that's it's a really hard comparison for 
local field potentials because the amplitudes vary. The, the waveforms are, they vary a lot, even in a, you know, well-behaving task. And so those challenges have made local field potentials really secondary to single units. And I would say that is missing one of the main points, though, with local field potentials and how we've been collecting that data. And so when we set, when, when we started to design new probes and, you know, adding electrodes to larger devices, a really amazing phenomenon jumps out at you. And uh, let me try to explain this with analogy. You, Aladdin, you're familiar with the cocktail party problem? No. Yeah. So the cocktail party problem is it's a form of, it's a challenge to do source separation. You've got a room full of people, a room full of people, and you want to decode everyone speaking in that room. You know, you could use independent component analysis. There's, you know, software approaches, uh, algorithm approaches to doing source separation in a situation like that. And that approach has failed with local field potentials. And for single units, we already have great separation approaches. Spike sorting has been very effective, but LOPs, it has not come to fruition. So there is a more fundamental way to, to do source separation. And I think usually I've got slides for this, this part of the argument, but let me try, let me lean on this cocktail party prop and scale it up. So imagine you have a super dome somewhere. And in this superdome, there's a billion people. And so your job as the engineer is to create a high resolution map of the crowd's vocalization during some live event. The rules are you only get to place, say, 10 or 20 devices. I'm using air quotes, which doesn't help anybody. Uh, like 10 or 20 devices throughout the stadium. And you can put in as many microphones as you want, and, but only on these devices. And so at some point, you realize more and more microphones on these poles are going to generate redundant information, and they won't help us in our challenge to map the vocalization of this massive stadium. And the reason I like that analogy, I think, is people, they have a very good intuition for sounds. And we all understand sound is directional. And I think anybody out there would immediately say, one good design would be you take microphones and you put them on this pole and not just any microphone. Generally, when you're buying microphones, there's two types, right? There's omnidirectional microphones and there's directional microphones. And so a very easy solution is to arrange these microphones in a radial fashion up and down the pole. And that very localized information allows you to map the vocalization with much, much more precision than just say if you had omnidirectional microphones. And so hopefully that analysis makes sense. Here's the issue. Microelectrodes are omnidirectional microphones. And so that really has been one of the challenges for many of the previous studies who have struggled to use local field potentials. Hey guys, just a quick pause to talk about our show sponsor, Ripple Neuro and Neuromed. If you're a scientist looking to get the best quality data possible in your animal and human e-phys experiments, then talk to Ripple. Get a complete solution for your neuroscience research application backed by dedicated support. Be sure to tell them you heard about it on the Neural Implant Podcast. That will really help us out. Thanks. Now back to the show. What's the solution to try to make them directional or something like this or what? Yeah, really for two years now, we've been modeling how do you make stereoscopic local field potential recordings? And so if every, so directionality does not exist for ring electrodes or micro wire light structures. And the reason it doesn't exist is because it's sensitive to all directions equally. And there's a phenomenon known as substrate shielding. So if in a volume conductor, if you place a neuron next to something like a Michigan array or a pixel array, there is shielding 
on the backside of that from the voltage emanating from the single unit. And Dave Anderson, and I think it was Kareem Oise, actually like 2002, they published this paper on it. And so this phenomenon is known where you can see directionality and neuron recordings. This does not apply to local field potentials until you get to larger substrates. So directionality comes from this unique combination of microelectrodes and larger substrates. And so if you were to plot this, and if for anybody listening, if they're really interested in this, there's a preprint online that shows lots and lots of plots, lots and lots, lots of modeling. What's another really fascinating thing about this relationship between the directionality and how do you define directionality is a really simple way to think about it is if the front side electrode has a very large amplitude and the back side electrode has a very small amplitude, that has a lot of directionality, right? And you can plot these directionality curves like polar plots, for example, and you want something very focused, ideally. And the larger the substrate becomes, and it has to be an insulating sub substrate, mind you, then the more directional is the effect. And so that turns out to be the real key. And so for local field potentials, what do the sources look like? And so it, in general, you can think of them as like cortical columns. So in this range of 200 microns, 400 microns, a millimeter, obviously a EEG recording is like a centimeter of synchronous neural activity. All these in-phase dipoles firing at the same time. This is how they model EEGs and MEG data. You reduce the gray matter to these cortical dipole moments. And so these dipole moments for a whole range of sizes are very effective, even at the dimension of an SEG, which is again, only 800 microns in diameter. And so a, a rough rule of thumb is if the substrate diameter is on the rough order of magnitude of the source, then there is good directionality in that situation. So you basically need your collector to be as small as possible. Is that basically the solution, right? No, actually any, even a relatively large microelectrode is pretty effective. So we spent some time modeling electrode size and it's not nearly as sensitive as the substrate diameter. And it is uh, another figure I, I love to show is electrode size as electro diameter. I should say voltage plotted as a function of electro diameter. And it even just grow the electrode until it finally becomes a ring. And, and so often it, and the, the clinicians, they love these ring electrodes because of very low noise, extremely low impedance, very low noise. And that obviously has a lot of practical value. And in our case, and back to the model. So as you grow the electro diameter, you start out at peak amplitude, but it really holds that value to about 120 microns, and then it starts to drop. And once you reach like Boston Scientific, they have these directional leads. They're about six, 700 microns in diameter, and they've lost maybe 40% of the amplitude. And then once you get down to the ring, you've lost 60% of the amplitude. So a big fall off. So yeah, you want, you want medium sized electrodes to me, 120 microns is a massive electrode. You get really low impedance with that. So single unit electrodes for people who aren't familiar, they might be 10, 15, 20 micron diameter. And so we can make these 120 microns and not lose amplitude. It's pretty exciting. Yeah. It sounds like you kind of get the best of both worlds and uh, yeah, optimize it. Okay. These you're, you're able to crack it. You're able to through finding the right size and the substrate diameter, you're able to have these directional electrodes and like this microphone on the pole, you're able to listen in from different directions and uh, triangulate and better localize where some of these noises are coming from. Is that you've been your experience? Yeah, so we have, so all the modeling is supported by our in vivo data so far, and we've only done this in rodents, I should say, but, and we use the whisker model because that's a really fun and effective model to get very precise spatial, spatially distinct evoked potentials. 
So we'll plant in the paracortex and generally stimulate nine whiskers and then feed that data into a classifier and compare it to something like a tetrode and ask the question, which one decodes the most information, which gets to the information capacity question. And uh, yeah, I think this is still first steps, but the physics behind this is just really strong. And I should say that I don't, there's no reason to think that the LFP and the single unit have to be mutually exclusive. It is possible, and people have used even larger devices, even up to 1.2 millimeters, that they can still record single units, even in humans. And that's not commonly done, but there have been a couple of papers that demonstrate that. And in fact, you get some amplification of a single unit. So we're, whereas with a microwire, one of the frustrating things of all microelectrodes on microstructures is that the recording range might only be 140 microns. But on larger st structures, because of this amplification effect, again, first described by Dave Anderson in 2002, you, you can go out to 200 microns. And so even though you're losing some tissue and you've lost neurons when you implant something of this dimension, you might be gaining that back and that sort of 60, 75 micron damage zone because of the added range. And let me be clear, we don't have a lot of data to support that, but there's no reason to think that the published work on that isn't real. So we're excited to try it. We're excited to try and get chronic data. One way I try to explain what we do is we're trying to address what I like to call the mesoscale gap. And I do absolutely love all the work that's happening with single unit recording arrays and so many different approaches, even the Utah arrays, which has been phenomenal and how effective it is. But there were so many people invested in that set of technology. I think this assumption that single units will always win in the battle for information capacity is still unproven, right? Like there's not a lot of evidence that must be the case, particularly if you can improve the fidelity of the LFP. And so we are addressing both just a te technology gap by pursuing this, this line of research and we're also addressing this mesoscale gap, which technically is in that 150 micron to five millimeter range. Where, so standard microelectrodes, they're not recording any units in that space. They only can record LFPs. And as, as we talked about, they have no directionality. So all the LFPs are talking on top of each other, which is why the source separation and the SNR is so challenging. And so by being able to break that up into these sectors of these volumes, smaller volumes of, of neural activity, we're getting strong information channels that are separable. And that shows up in the decoding, such as this nine class whisker task that we've run. That's pretty cool. Okay. If I'm understanding this correctly, basically you'd be getting almost single spike level data with LFP, you're basically merging, you're basically getting the both best of both worlds and, and you're able to, I don't know, decode both of them. I don't know, simultaneously. Is that, am I understanding yeah. that correctly? What's the advantage of, of your technology? What does it change? Like what, yeah. How does it improve the field? I would say that the question you just asked is the key question that the answer to that is probably going to first come from computational modeling. Let me explain that a, a little bit deeper, but the short answer is we are trying to model, develop models sophisticated enough to answer your question. And so first, the short answer is we have no evidence that we can record both and use both. We have no evidence that there's that there's independent information in those, and therefore they will add to greater decoding accuracy. I hope to get there. It seems plausible, but would challenge like everybody listening. We have to answer the question. And even though we're told single units are the best approach, I think the computational models and then surgical experiments 
validation in animals is really the way to go. But information theory and, uh, and these decoding tasks are really effective at peering into this. And so the way you can do it with computational modeling alone is, are you familiar with the Blue Brain project? No. This is Blue Grain, is what would you say? Blue Brain Blue project. Brain. No. Yeah. So Blue Brain, it was a north of a million billion dollars investment in Europe to develop in silico biophysical models, very detailed. And they built their model on the backbone of Neuron, the Yale program. So that's still the, been an extremely effective tool. And so, but the challenge for them was to one, to scale up, for two, to really get the details right. So they took decades and decades of neuroscience and they built, for example, their first model was for S1 in a rat. And this had something, only to the exact number, like something like 28,000 neurons, all wired using sort of the state-of-the-art knowledge of the somatosensory cortex in rats. And so with a model like that, you can create beautiful local field potentials. In fact, many groups have done it with far fewer. So let me be clear, you don't need that many neurons to generate local field potentials, but this is the level, the sort of state of the art. This is how far you can go in terms of generating details. And so in these in silico models, we can implant, virtually implant our sensor arrays and place them near and around and ask all sorts of questions about sensor array optimization. And so we've invested a lot in this problem and it just, obviously it, it takes some high performance computing and it takes a lot of attention to detail, but this is where we're pushing it. And so the whole field, and you have to do this for every application, which gets harder and harder as, as the networks get bigger. But it's very important, I think, to quantitatively answer these sorts of questions, which is why we're focusing on things like a barrel field, where you have very distinct cortical columns. We understand a lot about how these things are wired and 25 cell types, and they're all have these prob probabilistically predetermined uh, connections, wiring diagrams. And so these things get assembled and there's a a fair amount of sort of randomness to every time you, you wire these up. So you can generate a nice set of nice diverse set of cortical column activity in something that represents S1. And so now in, in that model, you place your electrodes and you ask questions, where am I getting the most resolution? Is it the single units? Is it the local field potentials? Is it with this device or that device? And I think, so this, that's a hard thing to answer, but this is, as a field, we have to answer this question. How do we optimally design to maximize information capacity? And our particular constraint, not everybody has this constraint, is that we want to implant our scientific payload through a 2.4 millimeter burr hole or twister a hole as the neurosurgeons call it. And we do that really for the safety of it. We know it's definitely low infection rate, and the recovery rate is also very low. Yeah, that's really interesting. And it's optimizing what the tools at our disposal and challenging assumptions. So I think that's really interesting. So what's holding you back? Why, what's preventing you from making the breakthroughs? I guess if you had unlimited funding, what would you be able to do with it? Unlimited funding? Yeah, I think <laughs> we'd, we'd be using a lot of uh, HPCs, that's for sure. Yeah, I don't think there's anything preventing us from solving any of these problems. There's, I don't think we need a magic wand to solve any of the problems, at least on, on this side, the computational modeling side. There's been so much progress made. If you look at TMS, for example, transcranial magnetic stem, they use computational modeling really quite effectively. And basically the neurologist can pick a point on, on, on a 3D image of that person's brain taken from a structural MRI, and the software will tell the technician exactly where to place the TMS device, what orientation, where, and, you know, so you can hit these targets with great precision. And that's a form of a forward model. And then the inverse modeling 
something like seizure detection, where you take all these voltages and then you use the inverse model to project back to where the sources were most likely to be. So all the math is there. It's just a great deal of engineering that goes into sort of bringing the forward model and the inverse model. And so you have your devices here, you've got these biophysically detailed forward models. And then, so, you know, one major application is if you, now you have devices in the brain and you want to know where the sources are coming from, that's the inverse model problem. And both are very similar. The solution to both those problems comes from lead field theory, which is a quite old theory, right? So lead fields have been this concept of lead fields, are what I call a sensitivity map of a particular electrode and this, and this volume conductor. And so once you generate the lead fields for a given sensor array, then you could move in and out these different forward models. And, and then you can either uh, predict the recorded voltages or given the voltages, you can predict where the sources were. So I think to answer your question, I think what's, there's nothing holding us back. It's just part of the process. So in a sense, I'm telling you about you know, our vision for where this technology needs to go. And the reason this computational approach is important. So the main reason was it can answer the fundamental question of how do we maximize information capacity? And then later down the road, it's going to be really effective in going from a patient seeing their, their physician, whether it's a neurologist or a neurosurgeon, to device design. And this is, this leads back to your first question, which is additive manufacturing. So if the patient, maybe they have seizures and they're not treated with drugs. So they have this refractory epilepsy. They see the neurologist, they get a EEG workup. They have a rough sense of where the seizures are coming. Then they go see the neurosurgeon. They'll probably perform depth recordings in this person. And with this technology, you can get very high resolution maps of where the seizures are forming. And in many cases, the unfortunate cases, seizures are not localized, but they have complex networks. And so resection surgery doesn't treat those patients. Now, so now you have a lot of information and how do you treat that? How do you treat that? So something like a neural pace device, you wanna stimulate and disrupt the network. And this is where the computational modeling comes in. So again, you have this really nice network map of where the seizures are coming from. And the question really then becomes, what is the optimal device to stimulate this brain region and that brain region? And also record from maybe this brain region and that brain region. And so every person's a little bit different. And just because you have the structural MRI, of that person and some background information doesn't mean you can easily solve a very complex problem. And because it really takes lead field theory and uh, deep analysis of all the sort of permutations that, that you could have for a, sorry, a set of electrodes implanted in a brain, imagine all the trajectories, the electrode pitch, the, the orientation of the devices, all these things go into so answering the question of what's optimal. And as smart as neurosurgeons are, like, I don't think they can answer that question. <laughs> and so I, we really need computational models to design for that particular patient, given the input being, here's the network we're trying to treat. What is the optimal design for that? And so the output of this meeting with your doctor and right, the right machine learning algorithms is a CAD file with that person's device designed already. And then that goes off to the manufacturer and they use additive manufacturing to customize that device for that patient. And, and so we think that all these things have to go hand in hand to really get to where we want to be. And when devices go into humans and you don't have a lot of extra cabling and you don't have to put the IPG in the subclavicle space, all those things reduce the risk to the patients. 
So what kind of difference, like what kind of percentage difference would you expect, I guess, between patients and also between these cortical areas as well? Is it something that would need to be remanufactured or if it's within a few percent, ah, it's good enough and might as well mass produce it? What's your feeling for it? Yeah, I don't know. It's a great question. We're pretty far from printing on the fly medical grade class three devices, right? I think, uh, yeah, I don't think we have to answer that right away. We know the alternative is, first of all, I don't think anyone's happy with state-of-the-art SEG or, or DBS and the manufacturing limitations that are just inherent in the way these things are made with wires and soldering. So we all know we want to go to higher channel count, whether it's stimulating or recording or both. And what's the alternative to additive manufacturing? It's microfabrication based approaches, which I absolutely love. That was, that has been my career, but I do see a roadblock with microfabricated approaches and that you really are limited in the customization that you can do. You're stuck in this 2D world as opposed to added manufacturing where you can literally print 3D structures. And in many cases, microfabrication for neuroscience tools, it's absolutely necessary. I don't think you'd get a thousand channels using additive manufacturing anytime soon on a relatively small device, but we can do hundreds of channels. And this is great for local field potentials. So the depth array is uniquely positioned for additive manufacturing where really advanced neuroscience tools, those are going to require high resolution that most, most printing devices can handle. So in terms of reliability, uh, yeah, I don't have any hard numbers on, on what is state of the art for 3D printing. And obviously you're limited by what your universities have. But yeah, we'll see. But I don't think there's any reason to think with the right investment, you can have the right tools and when they're dedicated for one person one purpose and really focused on one set of parameters on the manufacturing front then yield will go up quite a bit yeah. okay okay very cool yeah this has been very interesting okay so i want to talk a little bit about your transfer now these few years ago you said you were at rice before exclusively and then now moved to both T health and rice What's been that, what's that been like? And uh, maybe to what kind of advice do you have for people in your situation or trying to get to your level of career, I don't know, accomplishments or something like that? A quick correction. I was at Michigan before coming Michigan. here. So yeah, I was sorry, exclusively sorry. at Michigan. And then I came to UT Health first and it took a joint appointment at Rice. So Landon, if you looked at my CV, you probably figured out, yeah, that's this is a long winded way to get to where I'm at. So it was a very circuitous path. And honestly, I think for me, it was a lot of luck. I started a long time ago, two, I think it was 2002. And at the time, MIMS was really hot. And so I went to the university, I applied to the University of Michigan, both in the EC department and the biomedical engineering department and Khalil Najafi and Ken Wise, I'm sure these are names like they were at the cutting edge of MEMS and silicon neuroprobes, and it was super exciting. And I remember feeling a little disappointed. I was not accepted in, in ECE. I was accepted in biomedical engineering in particular. I was fortunate enough to be in Daryl Kipke's lab. And at the time, Daryl was, uh, he was focused on polymer probes in general. And I was worried that approach would be like second rate to silicon devices. And it, it turns out to be, it, in some ways it's true, <laughs> but the polymer probes are certainly going to be the future of translation. I don't see something like thin film silicon translating to humans in a really effective way. And that's just an example of sort of the luck I think it takes to get to where you're in a space, you're in a field that really becomes high impact. I think the, the brain initiative in 2012, that was, I realized the opportunity I had to go back to academia after getting a PhD and I went to work at Neuronexus. And I lacked a, probably a lot of confidence that I could make it in academia, 
but knowing that, you know, I had a lot of knowledge in that space and this large investment, I think it attracted a lot of people in back into sort of like hardcore brain research and seeking NIH funding and making an impact there. And so neuroscience tools were really hot at the time. So that sort of gave me the courage to jump back into academia as research faculty at Michigan. So identify a hot area in a decade and then let it grow around you. Is that kind of the, <laughs> is that kind of the advice? I wouldn't, I would say particularly for, for somebody who's like first gen to college and maybe like a blue collar background, all of this space, it seems so rarefied, getting a PhD, being an academic, it seems absolutely so rarefied that I could never imagine myself in that position. So for me, it, it took a lot of opportunities laid out before me, before I would actually go and do it. And I, I don't, I'm certainly not recommending that folks have, the, they're trepid about the academic path. In fact, I think graduate school, at least as seen by, you know, most Americans is really undervalued. And it, it took me a while just to decide to go to graduate school. Then it took me a while to decide to go to academia. And yeah, I, I look back and I wished I had been more confident. And I think, yeah, there's nothing, yeah, it, obviously it's, it's not easy to get an academic position. It's not necessarily easy to land big grants, but the way I honestly see it, and I'm not just saying this, if I could do it, then I think anybody can do it. And I'm here really because of grit and just given a, a, a few obvious opportunities and just sticking with this space. And so being in the space for as long as I have, 2002, that's a long time. So yeah, that's not a lot of great advice. I'm just explaining how I got here. I think there are much more efficient ways to achieve that, the goal of academics. But I think for most people in this space, you ask yourself the question, do you enjoy playing in the sandbox? Do you really enjoy research? And that's why grad school, I think, is really undervalued. And I hope people who maybe they have the undergraduate degree and they're thinking, which what I was thinking at the time, I'd rather get paid than take effectively take a pay cut and go work in somebody's lab. And for me, I was at Patel Memorial Institute at the time, and they did a lot of contract research work. That environment exposed me to some really interesting research, but not everyone got to do it. And it was quite obvious that the people with the advanced degrees had the most exciting problems laid before them. And then I realized, wow, that's what I want. I want the really hard problems, but I'm really not prepared to handle those problems. So that was the jump back to graduate school. Yeah. It sounds like you didn't really have a good roadmap or didn't really have a good understanding of what everything entailed. And this is actually the, the same way I feel is I had no idea what I would want and what the real world would look like. And it really is. I, I think your experience at Patel is uh, quite lucky because you could actually see different outcomes, you could say, and uh, that, that could really guide you in terms of what you want. But yeah, I think, uh, yeah, it's just a bit of trial and error and you got to see what you like. And uh, some people hate some of the things that you love and some people love some of the things that you hate. It's, it's pretty crazy stuff. I really, I remember when I realized that it blew my mind. <laughs> Yeah, John, I think this has been excellent, really nice deep dive into some of this work. And I like diving into some, I guess, unexamined assumptions. And I think this LFP versus single spike neuron, I think that's something that I literally hadn't heard before. And that is something that we need to examine. That is something that we need to look into and then be like, okay, single spike is better. What if we change this? Or what if we change the correct characteristics? What if we improved this and this? So I think this has been really interesting. Is there anything that we didn't talk about that you wanted to mention? Yeah, let me throw in a quick sales pitch. So UT Health Neurosurgery, uh, like I mentioned, we've invested heavily in neurotechnology we have a, we're expecting a very large UG3, so we, we are looking for postdocs. And we have this institute we call the Texas Institute for Restorative Neurotechnologies. 
our director is also the chair of, of neurosurgery. And so we're really committed to like a really strong incentive plan program for bringing in a top-notch postdocs to use devices like I discussed today. So these advanced depth arrays that can be used by neurosurgeons, safe, effective, stereotactically delivered and delivered very quickly. Yeah, we're expecting to get human data and we're looking for postdocs in the area of manufacturing and speech decoding and Dr. Tandon's lab, especially. They're very hardcore focused on the neuroscience of language, which I think puts us all in a, in, I think in a strong position to potentially someday down the road, treat the debilitating diseases like aphasia, which is like one out of one in 250. These are really big numbers. And we're not going into aphasia patients and this particular grant, but so this would be for the epilepsy patients, the EMU, but it allows us to do speech decoding in these patients and compare our technology to conventional technology. So that'll be exciting. Yeah, that is very exciting. And I hope you get those grants and you seem to have a lot of openings. It, as we were talking about before we started recording, that yours seems more like a more of a professional lab, fewer students and more postdocs and engineers. So you can join this, uh, you know, this league, almost, almost a little bit like Battelle, maybe that, that maybe that's what you're modeling it after <laughs> subconsciously. <laughs> I don't want you to chase off any prospective graduate students either, right? Yeah, we're interested in both. And yeah, some of these programs do lend themselves to heavy postdoc labs and lab engineers. And our lab engineers are phenomenal. So we've been lucky in that regard. It definitely takes, a, I think, a slightly different mix than just like pure graduate students for like DARPA-like programs. The UG3, UH3 is it's very milestone driven. And is that I won't call it DARPA, but it's pretty aggressive. Yeah, for sure. Dr. Seymour, this has been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Lad. Hope you enjoyed the show and were able to learn something new, bringing together different fields in novel ways. Until next time on the Neural Implant Podcast.